One very specific question I wanted to ask you is why hypergraphs? Would graphs be sufficient or do we need hypergraphs? So absolutely, graphs would be completely sufficient. And a lot of the stuff that we've done has just used graphs. And if you go back to the stuff Stephen was doing in 2002, it was just using graphs. It was using yeah. specifically these, these trivalent networks. So the reason for choosing hypergraphs actually goes back to the thing I mentioned right at the start about this idea Stephen had had about how to simplify the kind of graph rewriting semantics. So when you, okay, uh, this is getting a little bit into the weeds of implementation details. This is great. I like that. <laughs> Good. Okay. If you imagine trying to write a graph rewriting algorithm. Yeah how you would go about doing that from first principles, you very quickly notice an important problem, which is, so suppose that you've got a situation where, you know, you, I don't know, you've got a, a rule that takes in, say, a triangle of vertices with sort of three edges kind of coming out of it, right? Yeah. So your rewriting rule is going to extract out a subgraph that's, that's sort of isomorphic to that from your graph, and then it's going to plumb in some new thing. Well, if that new thing has less symmetry than the thing you extracted out, so for instance, if it only has two dangling edges rather than three, well, now you've got some ambiguity of how you plumb it in. Yes. Not only is there ambiguity in where you apply the rewrite, but there's actually, even for a single application point, there's ambiguity in, in, in how you kind of rearrange the symmetries so that, you know, so that the thing plumbs in correctly. Yeah. You can kind of get around the problem of non-determinism of where you apply the rewrites, but when you have rules that effectively lose symmetry, the fact that that introduces a new kind of ambiguity in the plumbing turns out to be a real pain to deal with algorithmically. So the solution that I mean, it's a partial solution that Stephen used in the NKS book is to use trivalent networks, to use graphs where every vertex has exactly three neighbors. That solves part of the problem because you, you, you remove a lot of the symmetry issues that way, but you don't get rid of all of them. So you have to have some fairly coarse way of restricting your rule space in a really rather arbitrary way yeah. in order to actually make the graph rewriting semantics work. The annoying thing is that it starts out as a very elegant idea of, oh, let's just use graph rewriting. And then the actual rewriting semantics you end up with end up being very, very aesthetically horrible because you have to do yeah. all these kind of weird symmetry checks. You have an equivalent problem if you have a rule that adds, you know, where, where the right-hand side has, a, has, has greater symmetry than the left-hand side because now, there's, you know, now you're going to okay. be left with, with, some, with some dangling piece coming out of it and where that dangling piece ends up, again, yeah. is effectively ambiguous. It's not determined by the rule and the location of application. And to be, to be a bit more precise about why that's an implementation problem, if you think about how you would describe an event, how you would describe the application of a rewrite rule in a graph. Well, for the most part, that's a very, very predictable data structure. You just have to say, what was the rule and what subgraph did it get applied to? But now if you've got the situation where your rules can add or remove symmetry, now you've got to have some additional piece to that event structure that says, well, you know, how exactly do you do the plumbing? And how much information you have to specify in order to be able to determine the plumbing depends on the nature of the rule. So suddenly, the, uh, the actual structure of your event is rule-dependent. Yeah. That's really unpleasant. Yeah. You don't want that, right? Yeah. So, so this was a complete nightmare from, a, from an implementation <laughs> and, and, and computer science point of view. Then Stephen had this realization that, well, maybe we're thinking about it wrong, right? Maybe we shouldn't think about these things as being graph rewrites. Maybe we should think about them as just being replacements of subsets. So if you think about just an ordinary graph, you could think about a graph as just being a, a set of ordered or possibly unordered, depending on whether it's directed or undirected. Yes. But just a set of, of, of binary relations between, between vertices, right? So in effect, it's just a set of subsets where each subset has, has cardinality two. Or maybe, you know, in the, in the directed cases, they're not subsets, they are ordered pairs, which are just subsets of a slightly different form. But whatever. So you just, you just think about it as being some abstract collection of relations between elements. Yeah. Well, then you could imagine defining a rewrite rule not on graphs per se, but just an abstract rewrite rule on subsets. So you just say, let's pick out three subsets satisfying this pattern, which in Mathematica has very, very nice ways of representing transformation rules based on pattern matching, and then replace them with another collection of four subsets matching a different pattern. Yeah. And when you translate it back, you know, that's really a graph rewriting rule, but it's a graph rewriting rule where the plumbing is, if you like, taken care of by how you fill in the generated variables in the subsets, right? So, so the, the, the ambiguity that I was telling you about before where you have a right-hand side of the rule which has less symmetry than the left-hand side, so you have to plumb the edges in in some predefined way. Well, in the subset case, all that's really saying is that the new elements that you generate on the right-hand side of the rule either have to have the same name or different names from the elements that you started from. Yeah. If they have the same name, then that's like a plumbing, you know, that you've effectively fused the vertices. If they have different yeah. names, then that's like a new generated vertex. Yeah. So A, that kind of solves the, all the symmetry issues that you get with trivalent graph rewriting as a stroke. But B, 
it means that, well, now if we're just thinking about these things as, as replacement rules on subsets, then there's nothing to say that the subsets in question have to have size 2, or the relations have to be of arity 2. You could imagine just doing this with, with relations of arity 3 or arity 4, or relations of kind of mixed arity or whatever. So suddenly you realize not only do you solve the graph rewriting problem, but you've kind of got a hypergraph rewriting semantics more or less for free. And that was this sort of rather elegant implementational idea that led to us considering hypergraphs rather than graphs. Not because we needed hypergraphs per se, but just because the, if you like, the solution that Stephen came up with to this problem that you get with graphs gave us hypergraph rewriting for free. And we thought we might as well make use of that even if we don't yep. expressly need it. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.